William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. What's in a name, a poet once said, and he was so right. You can list every guy as Smith or Dokes, and it doesn't make any difference. The stiff down below positively doesn't care what the tombstone reads. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. A case sometimes comes at you all the way from left field. It's out of the ordinary, and the familiar ingredients, familiar to a confidential cop, seem to be missing. At first glance, that is. Said familiar ingredients, of course, being theft, homicide, and blackmail. The nice, homey, everyday stuff of crime that keeps a cop in love with his work. In this case, even the kickoff was unfamiliar. The chap setting up the deal for me was a mine doctor, a skinny guy with horn-rimmed glasses and a high forehead, who looked like he got all his nourishment from pills. This, uh, this is an unusual thing for me, Mr. Craig, to consult with a detective. This is an unusual joint for me to be in, so we're even. Now, this patient that I will discuss with you, I, I've worked with him for months with uh, encouraging results. I'll start off with his name. His name is, uh, temporarily, Clark Smith. Temporarily? A symptom of his ailment is an amnesia. He uh, resists his own true identity. Doesn't want to remember who he is, huh? Yes, in a manner of speaking. That's bad. Well, why do you say that? From a cop's point of view, disregarding the medicine, a guy only tries to lose his identity for a pretty grim reason. Some crime he doesn't want to answer to. Oh, there is uh, such a possibility, yes. Still think you want to make a police case out of this, uh, Clark Smith? Well, there is the risk you suggest. Uh, I have thought of that. Restore this man to his own identity, but uh, with an unhappy result. He faces the consequences of a crime. Capture, trial, and sentence. But if this risk is not taken, it's equally critical for Clark Smith. Meaning the shape he's presently in, huh? Depressed, malingering, sick with anxieties. He, he cannot function as a social being. He hides from the world. Yes, he, he interests me, this Clark Smith. I would like to help him find himself, help him to face his reality. Only your medicine goes just so far. I need a detective such as you to associate with the case. There are facts to ascertain, the, the special things in which you are a specialist and in which my science is helpless. Got any clues to his background, who he was before he became Clark Smith? Oh, yes, I have many. I've uncovered many clues in my six months now of clinical examination. In my patient's moments of uh, unconscious association, he has given me many material clues that you'll find helpful in your search. Well, clues like... Uh... Well, words, for example. Oh, I, uh, <clears throat> I have them recorded here. Uh, Midvale. Now, there have been many reminiscences involving the word Midvale. Sounds like a town. Yes, or a school, I have thought. Uh, a high school, perhaps, judging by the level of my patient's speech. The, uh, the education, it suggests. And uh, the word pomatone. An Indian word. And very lyrical. The word is always said with a caress, always with a curious tenderness of feeling. Like Clark Smith loves it. Yes. Pomatone. Could be a river. A place to swim or fish for trout. A man can fall in love with a river and never forget it. Remember it all his life, even with his mind dead to everything else. Yes, you're very perceptive. A river, yes. I, I have thought so, too. Two good clues, those. Trace a guy back to where he came from, back to where memory cut off. Does Clark Smith know what you're up to with me? Not exactly. Uh, he knows in his own way. He wants to recover his identity, appreciates my interest, yet... Uh, He's scared. Well, he may resent what we do. You may find him very uncooperative. Where can I see him? I'll give you his address, but please be very gentle with him. Do not press too hard. Mm -hmm. 
I found Clark Smith at home. Home was a beach shack out on Long Island. Shangri-La made out of plywood and thumbtacks, serenaded by big seagulls with wing spreads like eagles. Smith looked the part of a beachcomber. He wore faded blue jeans slit at the sides and a fish knife in his belt with a mean-looking blade. He gave me the long once-over. It's a 35-pounder. No kidding. The striped bass. I pulled her in at the Anthony Lighthouse. I broke two lines on her. Sounds like quite a battle. Quite a battle, yeah. You'll find her in the shed, packed to nice. Leave the money on the table. I'm not a fish buyer. I'm Barry Craig. Barry Craig? Right now associated with Dr. Vanna. To help you, Smith. Help you get back to the life you belong to. I belong here. What are you after with me? I said to help you. Dr. Vanner and me. We're on your side. We're your friends. I don't want help. Sure you do. If you didn't, you'd never have gone to Dr. Vanner in the first place. I, I went to find peace. So I'd calm down. To fish, you need to be calm. You went to find yourself. Don't back away from one big truth, Smith. You're one big inner drive. Mr. Craig, I'm afraid. Sure you are. I understand. But I say you can't be any worse off than you are now. Have a little faith, Smith. Faith. Midvale and Pomatawney. What do the words mean to you? I, I, I don't know. I, I know the words, but I, I don't know what they mean. I don't know. Okay, forget them. I'll try to find out another way. If I'm stuck, I'll come back to you. We'll go over it again. We'll go out in a boat and fish and talk. Midvale and Pomatawney. Clues sometimes take you for a ride around the moon. You're a sky rider spelling out the word futility. Other times it all comes easy, too easy. You don't have to be a detective. Just a researcher with a world almanac. The section that says index of towns and places and rivers. I found the river Pomatawney merely by running down a line of names of American rivers. The Pomatawney River, but it wasn't in any town called Midvale. The Pomatawney River was in Farrington, a town in Jersey. I kept hunting Midvale in the book. Anything named Midvale in the town of Farrington. I checked school, high schools and universities, then industries. Under industries, I found it. The Midvale Bottling Works, located in Farrington. I had reason to hop a train to Jersey. One horse Farrington had a sheriff. It also had a barber. Both rolled into one. The sheriff and the barber were one and the same guy. Came a shortage of lawbreakers. At least there was always hair to cut. I phoned you in advance of coming, Sheriff. You know why I'm here. Yes, I know. But just a minute till I get out of this coat. Can't Sheriff in a barber's coat. Why not? Just not right, that's all. Now can we get down to it? Not yet. Can't Sheriff without my badge. Here it is. Now, about this missing feller. I took this snapshot. I sneaked the picture. The guy's sensitive to attention, so don't expect too much. Well, ever seen him before? Yeah, picture's kind of blurry. My $2 camera, I'm sorry. No, can't say I ever seen this one. For what there's to see. But you don't need to be showing me pictures. Only one man's disappeared from Farrington in the years I've been barber. How about in the years you've been sheriff? Same answer. Lloyd Beamer. He's the only one who's disappeared and ain't never turned up. It's uh, six, uh, seven years now. Maybe eight. Coming right down to it. Fill me in on Lloyd Beamer. Oh, ain't much filling I can do. Just that Beamer ran the Midvale Bottling Works. Uh, that's right on the county line. Owned it, Beamer did. Till he went. Went where? Can't say. Nobody can say. Bit flighty, that Lloyd Beamer. His head was always in books. Lived in the town, but she wouldn't know it. Kept to himself. Even on election day, never showed up to vote. Imagine. Who runs the bottling works now? Mrs. Beamer. That's uh, Lloyd's wife, Polly. She's there now, minding things. If you'll be wanting to talk to her... I'll be wanting to. The first thing that meets your eye in a bottling works are bottles. Lots and lots of bottles. I found a door marked private and used it. On the inside of the door was somebody who looked like privacy was wasted on her. 
Too many good looks to keep them all to herself. A face you'd expect to find in Tahiti, never in a bottling works. Yes? Am I intruding? You've already intruded. Mm. You're chilly? I always am in refrigerated rooms. How about a warming smile? I'll have you arrested. You didn't let me finish. A warm smile of gratitude on account of the great thing I'm about to do for you. What is that? Reunite you with your husband. My, my husband? Uh-huh. Don't you want to be? Is this some practical joke? I'm a comedian, only up to a point. Well, what's the matter? <sighs> matter? You're green around the gill. I I feel faint. Your, your remarks, I, I was utterly unprepared. I'm all right now. Well, take more time. No. Please talk. Your husband, Lloyd Beamer, has been missing. For more than six years, yes. I've got a fellow I think could be Lloyd Beamer. It's impossible. Why? Why? Because in all these years, there's never been a word. That makes it strange, but not impossible. A man loses his memory. How does he know who to write to, be in touch with? This person, you say he cannot remember? Amnesia of a kind. I'm piecing his past together, reconstructing a picture. I'm a detective from New York, Barry Craig. How did you come upon this person? You keep saying this person. I've come to think of my husband as dead. I've accepted it as so. Why? Why? So I could find peace with myself. Stifle imagination, the nightmare of thinking, not knowing. I was deserted, Mr. Craig, by a man with violent currents in his nature. A man bent on destroying everything around him and himself. It was better to think of him as dead. So I could have some peace, some life. I'm sorry. I guess I was a jolt to you. A trifle crude in my approach, maybe. Of course, this man might not be your missing husband. It may turn out that he's not. But you seemed so very sure before. Some clues relate him to the town of Farrington, to these bottling works. Clues, but they may be coincidental. You never know. What? The lady. Oh, I'm sorry, but I think I'm going to... Hey. The lady. It was a faint, the deadest faint I'd ever seen. A faint like death, and the frightening thing about it, it could be death. A heart attack from the shock of it all. For all the pulse I was getting, the next move could be the coroner's. You know that someone apparently dead isn't when she flutters her eyes at you. A corpse generally can't. Polly Beamer flooded her eyes at me. I was close enough to admire their color. Oh, what, what happened? You passed out, a dead faint, and no pulse like your heart had stopped pumping blood. Oh, I'm sorry if I unnerved you. I've got a few gray hairs as a memento. I hate to say hello to a girl and have her promptly drop dead. The news you brought me, it, it was so overwhelming. Apart from the news itself, what else gave you conniptions? What else? The prospect of a return of Lloyd Beamer, your missing husband, I don't think you fancy the idea as a woman. No, I, I don't. We were never so much of a couple. Besides, I've built a whole new life for myself since... A new life meaning a new guy? A new interest, a new independence and outlook. You're glossing over the new guy? There are men in my life, of course. Men or a man? I'm young, I have a right. No question of it. All right, then, the way it stacks... If my party is the missing Lloyd Beamer, reassuming his proper station can create complications. Complications? He isn't wanted. No welcome home. Rough on a guy, kind of. A return to identity at long last, only to find himself on the scrap heap. I don't think this person you talk about is my husband. You mean you hope he isn't. But we'll soon know. I've got a couple of more questions. Yes? Assuming my party is Lloyd Beamer... I've given you an idea of the condition he's in. Loss of memory, you said. Yes, an acute case. He's been under medical care. Now I ask you, why would Lloyd Beamer suffer a loss of memory? I don't understand the question. The medic handling Beamer hinted that this patient may be helped induce his own condition. Blanked out so as not to remember something too painful. Blanked out to escape being Lloyd Beamer, if you get me. Yes, yes, I do understand you. Again, assuming this is your husband... So what was he running from? What was he running from? Trouble, a crime maybe, something he was guilty of, and the fear of discovery. There was nothing like that in my husband's affairs. Okay for that. I'm glad to hear it. Then the escape was for, let's say, strictly personal reasons. 
personal problems of non-criminal character. Lloyd was an eccentric, secretive. He never could quite fit into the group. He found business, this business, intolerable. He found marriage too commonplace. I see. Call him a pathological personality. Oh, one last question. Yes? Whoever listens in on talk in your office, does he do it with your approval or on his own? Well, what do you mean? I'm looking straight ahead. Into that mirror on your wall. There where the safe is. Twice so far, I've seen a face in the mirror. A face not my own. I'm not two-faced, lady, so I assume there's been me and somebody else. Somebody peeking through the connecting door behind me. This door. Peeking and eavesdropping. Well, there's nobody. Not now. He's gotten an air fall and decamped. You don't care? Care? About being eavesdropped on? I don't know that we have. We have, believe it. Who was it? I don't know. We have 30 employees in the plant. Heavy brows, eyes deep in his head. This connecting door behind me, he had it open to an aperture of six inches. Where does the door lead to? Well? It leads to the office of the plant manager. Namely? Howie. Roy Howie. I'll go introduce myself. Oh, by the way, pictures. Got any around of your missing husband? Why, yes, at home somewhere, packed away. I'd appreciate one, a good one, to take back to New York with me. No, I won't give you any pictures. Why not? I'll do nothing to, to facilitate the return of this person you say may be Lloyd Beamer. The man's sick. I'm asking you to help restore a man's memory. I'll do nothing to facilitate that either. Pretty shoddy attitude. I don't care. I feel selfishly about this. We were through. I've let freedom grow around me, freedom from the nightmare of Lloyd Beamer. Why can't you let me alone? Why did you have to come here at all? Roy Howie, do I need a pass to get in to see him? The plant manager, Howie, had the perfect explanation. Yes, I did over here. <clears throat> the fact is, I had some uh, memoranda for Polly's signature. These forms. But, uh... I found her engaged with you. You stood glued to that crack in the door. Thinking that she'd be finished with you momentarily. I don't mind confessing that I was fascinated by what I heard. Became absorbed in it. Why? Other people's business. A morsel of gossip. This is Farrington Township, Mr. Craig. Very little happens in Farrington. We're hungry here for something eventful. The sensational attracts us like moths to the flame. We're all of us talented eavesdroppers and busybodies. I'm being very frank. Yeah, very frank and very, very artful. I've read about New York private eyes, the unusual breed you are, your obsession with motives. Suspect everybody. Isn't that your daily religion? You talk a glib line for a jerkwater town bottling plant manager. <laughs> Snarl, curse, and break heads. That, too, is the classic cliché of the New York private eye. Well, why aren't you breaking my head, Mr. Craig? An important thing to know about one-horse towns is how to get out alive. I called a local taxi to take me to the railroad depot, a mile run on a big ditch they call the road. Oh, the bumps I took my insides were in a heap. At a bend in the road where spruce trees lining it made a perfect ambush, somebody tried to drop the rest of me in a heap. Oh. Oh. I got it in the right hand, the check writing hand. The local hack driver kept going, like he hadn't heard a thing. I got first aid at a shack that had a decalcomania emblem of mercy pasted on a window. The guy cauterizing my wound was a familiar face. I'd seen him before. He was the barber. Or did I mean the sheriff? Regular docks 14 miles over the hill. Oh, yeah. switch to your painless method, why don't you? Ain't much of a nick in that hand of yours. I'm treating it right. Short of amputation. Yeah. I'll bandage it up now, and you're as good as new. What do I owe you? 50 cents. Same as for a haircut. A bargain. Who shot me? Uh, can't say. I ain't investigated it yet. But you've got a pretty good idea. All right, I'll tell you. That Roy Howie's been shining up to Polly Beamer. Takes her on corn husking parties and quilting bees. He's wild for her and infernally jealous, that fella. I wasn't making a play for Polly. 
You come in here with news about Lloyd Beamer. Now with Polly asking the judge to free her from a man who's been away so long, Roy Howie wasn't taken kindly to that. Howie figures he's going to marry her, huh? When her divorce or annulment, as it, comes through. Howie's figuring that. That uh, bottling works is the biggest thing in Farrington. It's a good marriage Howie's after. I made hasty tracks out of dear Farrington Township. I had unexpected company on the train, right on the seat beside me, white-faced but smiling. A fetching smile that figured to melt men's hearts. Polly knew how to turn it on. Surprised, Mr. Craig? Not too. I figured if Howie failed to kill me, you'd try it another way. I don't understand. Charm me to death. And you're doing it. Doing what? Sitting closer than train regulations allow and breathing on my neck. Before what you said, Howie's failing to kill you? Come off it, lady. It's you and Howie, one nod away from the altar. Wedded bliss the minute some judge signs a final paper. I popped in with a facsimile of your missing husband at a bad time. All right, it's so. I won't attempt to lie to you. Howie and I are in love, planning marriage. But I gummed up the work. If this person is who you say he is, I'm frightened. Frightened enough to endorse murder? Howie didn't attempt your life, not really. He just meant to scare you, make you stop meddling in our lives. And I did not endorse it, Mr. Craig. Howie's impulsive, sometimes foolish. It was his own foolish scheme. Which brings us to you sharing a seat with me. To go with you and confront this person you say might be Lloyd Beamer. To see for myself. Okay, we'll try it. But after I prepare him. You got a favorite New York hotel you can park in? I have. The Warumbo. We'll soon know whether you're still a wife or a bride-to-be. With Polly biting her nails at the Warumbo, I followed the seagulls to where my beach coma parked his amnesia. The striped bass are running better. Got a 40-pounder in the shed. Well, let's get off the fish. I've got a few things to tell you. Things that might be biographic. So you've gone ahead about me. I've gone far. I might do you some good if you don't offer too much resistance. If you're afraid, don't be. My information is this. The man I think you might be has no crime to answer for. Well? I'll try to cooperate. Good. I'll throw words at you. The Midvale Bottling Works, Farrington Township, Jersey. A guy named Roy Howie. Roy Howie? You sound like it's familiar. Yes, it... Somewhere in my head. Another name, Polly. Polly Beamer. Is that somewhere in your head or heart? Polly Beamer. Yes, I, I believe I know the name. You could be a Lloyd Beamer from the evidence so far. Polly Beamer is Mrs. Lloyd Beamer. Well, I, I'm confused. Sure, I know, but you're standing up great, better than I thought. Are you up to a visit with Polly Beamer? Polly Beamer, who may be my wife? Uh-huh. Again, only if you're up to it. Take me to it. I brought Smith to the Warumbo Hotel. Polly made an odd request of me. May I talk to this person alone? If you're going to insist. Please, Mr. Craig, I don't relish being emotional in front of third parties. Meaning me. Okay. I'll wait in the hall. Call me when you're ready. Polly called me in in less than ten minutes. She'd been crying, crying her eyes out. Mr. Craig, you can come in now. Thanks. Any result? This man is Lloyd Beamer, my husband. You're sure? Could I be mistaken? No, I guess not. Turn about now, Polly. Your turn to wait in the hall. It's two alone. Me and Beamer. What on earth for? I'm completing a job, Polly, wrapping it up. Your questions are out of order. Wait outside. I'll go, of course, if you must. Now you, Beeman. Yes? That's really your name, huh? The one you lost somewhere. Yes, I'm... I'm Lord Beamer. I'm still a little new, but... But you're not too unhappy over it. Pretty wife, a bottling plant. Quite a change from a beachcomber. It sounds like you begrudge me. If you're Beamer, I'll shake hands and say goodbye. Report back to Dr. Vanner, my original client. Tell him the good news. 
if you're Bima. Well, now you're talking like you don't think I am. I just don't know, but I will know in a minute. It seems Bima had a mermaid tattooed on his chest. A mermaid? I got this from intimate sources, uh, the sheriff, close friends of the Bimas. Strip, mister, so I can see your chest. Now, wait a minute. Then I'll do it for you. Hey. No tattoo, mister. You're a phony. Okay, what's the game? I'll answer it. Blackmail. You've got enough on Polly Beamer to make her accept you as Lloyd Beamer, even though she knows you're a phony. That's why she wanted to be in here alone with you. Find out what you had on her. Well? I've got nothing to say. Then keep listening. The amnesia was a fake, a pretense right from the start. You used Doc Vanner as a dodge and then began using me. I was to lead Polly Beamer to you, warrior, so she'd be apple pie in your hands. Your so-called amnesia for all these years was a device to provide an explanation for Lloyd Beamer's long absence. Whatever explanations might be needed, in Farrington Township especially, well... I've still got nothing to say. Then you're a sucker. Confession, you might mitigate police charges against you. You're licked anyhow. The scheme's boomeranged. You won't get Polly, and you won't get a dime. You'll, uh, you'll help me get off? I'll put in a good word. Okay. Lloyd Beam is dead. I got to know him in the years he'd run off from his wife. He's been dead a few months now. Who murdered him? His wife, Polly. She discovered his whereabouts a few months ago, in the shack out on the island. She shot him and buried him in the cove. She didn't know that all the time there was an eyewitness. You? Yeah, me. I was out in the shed packing ice around some bass. Polly thought Beamer was living there alone as a hermit. <laughs> the fact is, it was Beamer's shack. He owned it. He'd invited me to share it. Beamer's corpse. You can lead me to it? I can. And you testify in court as an eyewitness to murder? I'll testify. Just how did you expect to crash Farrington society as Lloyd Beamer with your face? I didn't. Polly and me, we were, we were going abroad right away. She agreed to go to Europe with me. With all the dough she had in a satchel? With dough, yeah. For a smart crook, mister, you're surprisingly stupid. Stupid? <laughs> you panic easy. <laughs> oh, I'm just beginning to catch on. That tattoo, the mermaid on Beamer's chest, you made that up. So I did. I'll go call Polly in. Polly? Polly, come in and face the music. Face the music? Murder, baby. If you've got one of those fancy feints handy, now's the time. I just found out how you murdered Lloyd Beamer. Uh, uh... Well, what do you know? She's gone and done it again. You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Fog Over Murder, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story titled The Hunted Husband, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, I'm hired to hunt a husband. I catch him finally, but by that time, it's become good hunting for something else, murder. Good night, folks. See you next week. The National Broadcasting Company has brought you William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Featured in the role of Polly was Terry Keene. Don Pardo speaking. Jack Webb stars as Sergeant Friday in Dragnet, next on the NBC Radio Network.